Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bible Thumper podcast. Uh, my name is Patrick Hayes, and uh, my co-host, Caleb Jenks, is in yet another new location. Uh, we don't want to stay consistent on his end, because heaven forbid the audio or video works smoothly just one time that we do this. And with Caleb uh, is his friend, Andy. Uh, Andy, I just had the pleasure of meeting you uh, here today over the course of the last hour and chat with you for a minute. Uh, Caleb, why don't you say hi and introduce your friend and and tell us a little bit about Andy. Yeah, it's good to be back. I'm excited about it tonight. It's going to be fun. So Andy is uh, probably, I would say, in Texas. I'll, I'll say this for Patrick's benefit. I'm going to put this uh, as a disclaimer. He's probably my best friend in Texas right now. Depending on what he says tonight, we'll see if it remains that way by the end of the episode. But um, we we are uh, we go to church together and spend a, a ton of time in prayer and uh, reading the Bible together, and just have, have had a lot of good times together. And I, I value him as a as a Christian, as a friend. And um, we disagree on this topic a little bit, uh, so I thought it'd be fun to have him on here to beat me up. So yeah. thanks for coming on. Absolutely excited about this. Let's go. Okay, so. Caleb, why don't you introduce kind of the different positions and what you know so far about Andy and myself and where you think this is all going to fall? So by the end of the weekend, I think Andy's going to have Andy's going to have his theology straightened out because we are in, <laughs> we are in we're in, in Plano, Texas, up here by Dallas for a, an ap apologetics conference that's actually started tonight and goes through the day tomorrow. So hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow, we will be. Uh, a little bit on more solid ground here, and Andy and I will be at the bar tomorrow night having a drink. Um, but in the meantime, in the meantime, we're completely sober. Uh, we neither neither of us have had any alcohol, and if I am not mistaken, Patrick is probably sober too. So this is yes, that's a good question. And let me just tell our viewers uh, to give you an idea: I have not had a drink in over twenty one years. So uh, if you want to know. Um, how soft of a hand I'm going to be playing uh, on Christian drinking. Uh, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> I'm definitely not the guy that, uh, you know, uh, thinks there's a brand of Christian whiskey that everyone should be drinking. So anybody that has PayPal or the cash app or anything like that, I'll go ahead and send you 10 bucks to take Patrick out and get him, <laughs> buy him a, a glass of wine tonight after we get on the podcast because he's going to change his mind. No, so yeah, obviously we we have a little bit difference of opinion. So I grew up in a home, Christian home, and we didn't. I never drank any alcohol, and I had actually quite a few reasons for why I did not want to drink alcohol. I was actually convinced that I never would, and that changed a couple of years ago. And um, I have enjoyed, on the occasion, I've enjoyed a glass of wine, and um, I, I personally think that I can do it with a clear conscience and. Um, that Patrick's not a better Christian than me, so he's going to convince us differently. Patrick, on the other hand, probably has drank a lot more alcohol than I have and has come to a different conclusion after reading the Bible and deciding not to drink alcohol again. Andy, yeah, just, just to be clear, drank, Andy? <laughs> go ahead, Andy, jump on in. Like maybe like a story behind that. I got yeah. tricked into doing it. Okay. Um, so it's not your fault. I got, no, I did it. And that's the story I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave because that's kind of <laughs> A story that I don't want to touch right now, but like I got tricked and taking like a sip or like one sip, and I remember taking that sip very clearly and being like, "This is this is this is wrong." I got tricked into doing this, um, but yeah, that's that's like that's the most I've taken, and I have my stance where I I believe in what I believe for that. So, so if anybody listening has some holy water, we could probably <laughs> we could probably deal with uh, Andy's one sip that he had one time and be able to go ahead and purify him again. Since, <laughs> anyways, yeah, I appreciate that honestly. So we have Andy, who has, uh, for all intents and purposes, never had a drink. We have uh, Caleb, who, I mean, I, I know Caleb, and I look up to Caleb as uh, one of my friends and as a Christian. I mean, I, I do admire Caleb. I, I, we make fun of each other a lot, uh, but I don't want anyone to be confused about that. You know, and, and Caleb... I would call on the low side of a moderate drinker as far as a Christian goes. And then as far as where I'm coming from, 
Caleb said Patrick's probably drank more than I have. I would argue that I have probably spilt more than Caleb has drank <laughs> in my drinking career. Um, I'm coming from a position of being a recovering alcoholic, and uh, I stopped drinking prior to ever holding a Bible in my hand or reading the Bible or getting saved or meeting Caleb. So <clears throat> I and and I say that. Uh, just to give people an easy way to write off any of my ideas as, oh, well, you know, none of Patrick's ideas are biblical. He's just against alcohol because he's an alcoholic and he doesn't like it. Uh, I, I happen to think that uh, the that I just happen to agree with what the Bible says. And I take the stance, which is, believe me, an unpopular one today in American Christianity, that alcohol consumption of uh, any kind or amount is prohibited by the Bible, except in circumstances surrounding uh, medical use. And the Bible actually outlines that clearly. So you're, you're definitely oh. getting a strong hand from me. <laughs> so have you, you never had any medical issues in the last, what was it, 43 years or 22 years? or tw tw The last 21 years. May 18th will be 22 years for me. So, and just to give everyone that verse, because it's going to come up sooner or later, so I figure we might as well just jump into it. You read in 1 Timothy 5.23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So okay, this so is a case. Stop it. We can just stop it right here. <laughs> right? Is, okay, get out the wine. My stomach's not feeling good. Exactly. <laughs> so all every Christian on a Friday and Saturday night, <laughs> their stomach's not feeling too good. So wait, wait, wait. Can you read that verse one more time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. First Timothy five twenty three. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So okay. it, it, now uh, let me explain the verse and then you can tell me where I'm wrong. So in this verse, I think it's one of the strongest cases against drinking alcohol, because what this verse is doing is giving you the one exception for when you can, which would imply that other than a medical reason, you cannot. So Timothy is using wine as an antiseptic because he has microorganisms in his stomach and he has an upset stomach. That's been a problem, obviously, for a little while. So Paul's telling him, well, drink a little bit of wine and that'll help your stomach. It'll kill the bug. And that's the case. For me, I have used morphine when I had my wisdom teeth taken out. And I don't think anyone would fault me for that. But I think everyone that's listening would agree that it's not okay for Patrick to use morphine for pleasure on a weekend, you know, at a party. But nobody in argued. Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little uh, there. yeah. Yeah. Legally, I might be allowed to, you know, but and, and I look at it the same way as far as Paul is saying, look, th this is a reason when you can have alcohol and, and it's justifiable. As a matter of fact, it says again in Proverbs 31, 6, uh, that you are allowed to give alcohol or to give strong drink to someone who is about to perish. So once again, it gives the same idea. Alcohol is allowed to be used in a medical scenario uh, in order to deal with pain management. When someone is about to die, they're on their deathbed. Yeah, give them alcohol the same way that hospice will make people comfortable on their way out. Uh, that makes sense. And there, I don't think many Christians would argue with that, but it's clearly explaining alcohol to be used in a medicinal way under certain circumstances. So I look at those two verses as a very clear indication of uh, when you can use alcohol. And the assumption would be that outside of those uh, exceptions, you are not allowed to. So Caleb, jump on in. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell well, me where I'm crazy. I, I'm gonna go ahead and let and I'm gonna go ahead and let Andy um, jump in on that. If you, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because I I completely disagree. But anyway, mm. so you can't you you got to be careful with that scripture because I've only got a couple of those that are that are on, in my favor here. So you got to make sure you cover the whole thing and you miss part of it. But anyway, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Andy jump in. Okay. So my 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 take on alcohol is is man, if people I, I as I said I haven't drank alcohol in the past. It's something I don't do on a Friday Saturday night. I've been you know. I've had a, a cough and they're like, hey, drink some, you know, drink some scotch, clear throat up, whatever the case may be there. I've never done that. Um, the reason behind my like not drinking is 
I don't have a problem with people drinking. That's my snack. Like if they want to drink a little bit now, drunkenness, I believe is wrong. I believe that is something that I, I strong. If you get drunk, I believe that is, that is something that is biblically wrong. Now, if you want to have a little wine, that's up to you. I personally don't. And this is why I don't. I don't because I believe that it comes an addiction. And especially at the, for the younger, I'm not sure who's all on this Bible Thumper page, but hey. We have up? like three. We, okay, we have like three. at least three. three. <laughs> I don't know what the age group is there. You know, like you got like a 50-year-old and then you got like a 35-year-old and then me. So um, for my, my stand is that. It's an addiction thing for me. I, I grew up in Belize, which where alcohol was a big thing. And I saw the I saw the the pain it brought through, you know, beatings through my through my cousins, you know, being tied up because they were going crazy. And it just honestly scared me. And it also brought the idea that I was scared that I would become addicted to it as well. And I never wanted to be addicted to something that I couldn't control. The Bible. The Bible has verses on addiction. I'm not exactly sure. I was looking at it before I got here. Caleb just told me about this like three days ago, so I didn't have time to, you know, become wise in this area. Um, but I do know that there's problems with addiction that I was scared about going in and dealing with alcohol. And plus, you know, I was always just like, I don't really need alcohol to have fun. Um, I can drink water while everybody else drinks alcohol. So my stand on drinking is if you want to have a little wine, I'm not going to judge you for it. I don't want to do it. Thank you. <laughs> but, don't worry, Andy. Plenty of judgment will come from Western okay, Colorado. Good. Okay, good. I'm a, I'll, be, I'll be ready for that. I'm waiting for him to, like, after we're done with this, I can see him go cry. And um, I'll go post on Bible Thumper page a picture of him doing that. So, but my stand is that it is, it is I feel like, especially for younger people that don't know when to stop. Um, I can understand if you're a 45-year-old, 50-year-old man that maybe you know your limit. And But I'm scared for the teens that they don't know their limit. And that's where I was. That's when I made my kind of conviction. It's not a – Caleb did bring a, a really good point on – we were talking about it about six weeks ago. I don't know, three months ago maybe. I honestly don't know. He said as long as, long as it doesn't become a prideful thing. And that's something that I do want to be very, very careful for. I don't want this to become a prideful thing for myself where I'm like, oh, I don't drink alcohol and, you know, I'm holier than you. I don't want that idea to ever come across. So there's one way to fix that. <laughs> so oh, it's like tempting me over here, like <laughs> depart from me. Um, but that is that. So that is something that I, I am trying to be very careful with by saying, you know, just because I don't drink, I don't want to be holier than you by doing that. But I do have my concerns, especially for, honestly, for everyone, but especially for the younger people that I'm scared they just don't know the limits. And one of the things that really got to me was a guy told me about a year ago, he was like, he was going through something. And prior to this, he was drinking a little bit and he realized that he no longer wanted to drink because he could see himself becoming okay when life was getting tough. He was then going to just a drink. He was a light drinking, but he was going to that. And that hit me because I'm a, I'm a, I get addicted very easy to things. And so that's the, that's where I stand. Um, I'm not exactly sure if, you know, all young people would be that way. But for me, that's exactly kind of where I stand with it. I don't want to become addicted to it. I've seen what it done to my relatives that have, you know, been alcoholics, um, you know, wasting their paychecks on drinks and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I stand on that. But, you know, if Caleb wants to take a drink, you know, I won't stand over him and watch him as he sips it. You know, I'll, I'll watch, I'll sit across from him and ask him if it's good and, if he has a belly ache and that's why he's drinking, I'll do that. But, um, you know, Andy, uh, you brought up a good point. Um, I'll tell you this because I've had uh, and I, and Andy, I know you and I are, are uh, newly acquainted. So I have six kids. Caleb is on his way. He's got three. Um, and and my kids are a little bit older. My oldest is 12. And I've already had the talks with them, you know, starting with drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I take a different approach. When I talk to my kids, I say, look, kids, uh, you, you never should take a drink. You should never try drugs because you're going to like them. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to like it. So stay away from it. Don't start it because you're going to like it and we're going to want to do more of it, you know, and, and keep in mind, 
you know, I'm not trying to debate, you know, responsible drinking or drug use versus, yeah. you know, abstinence. Yeah. Um, but that's what I always tell my kids, you know, rather than it being the forbidden fruit that they can't wait to try. I'm like, exactly. look, you're, you know, you're going to like it. That's why people keep doing it. You know, if, if we all hated it, we would have stopped immediately. So, um, Caleb, I just want to read this one verse and then I want to hear from you. I want you to jump in here. So Proverbs 20, verse one says, Mine, uh, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Caleb, take the mic. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Point. He's tapping out. He's, he's, he needs to tap out right now. <laughs> If you need me right, to read so that verse again, gonna, just let me know. <laughs> no, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll quickly respond to that verse, and then I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Um, I have something else I want to say here. So, I would. I have actually read that verse, and that's an interesting verse. There's actually a lot of very, very strong verses in the Bible against drinking, and I think that 99 times out of 100, that people drink, it's detrimental and it's bad. And so, if you're deceived by it, to me, when whenever you get to the point that you start losing control of your facilities physically and you become drunk that's the that's the problem with wine it's the abuse of the wine and it's the fact the reason that we should not ever touch it is because of the fact that we have a tendency to abuse it and lose control and the more we lose control the more we become addicted go ahead let me ask you a question just to get kind of a base okay so andy would you would you say yes or no getting drunk is a sin yes or no yes okay caleb drunkenness being drunk getting drunk is a sin yes or no absolutely we all agree. okay okay and i would agree with that too just to give us a baseline so that people don't come back later and argue a point we never made i just wanted to wanted to hit that because we've all mentioned it and kind of dance around it forgive me for I interrupting so much, Caleb. I, no thanks for interrupting <laughs> i i have warm fuzzy feelings all over i feel so much better now so okay we all good. agree so before okay. everyone no. says that we're all okay with drinking exactly. you know Let's just, you know, I just wanted to kind of okay. start somewhere. Okay, so please uh, take over. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I definitely disagree with, with the idea of, of getting drunk. And I understand why the majority of Christians tend to frown on drinking and, and alcohol is looked at as like the devil's, the devil's poison. I mean, you're, you're playing with the devil when you touch a bottle. A lot of preachers will incorporate, you know, um, among sexual immorality and everything, they'll talk about tipping the bottle. And I'm like, all right. So I don't ever drink out of the bottle. I'll make sure I pour it in my glass first. There you go. Or at least have a paper bag around the bottle <laughs> while you're sitting on the curb in a downtown <laughs> section of a major city under a bridge. I mean, that that's the classy way to do it. Or, or you know what? Bring that bag into church, right? So you, you, you take your bag, you go sit in church. I'm with you. I mean, I get it. So go ahead. Okay, so... Anyways, so I have a lot of respect for both of you guys. I honestly think that for both of you, you guys have made the right choice to never drink wine. Now, back to the scripture you mentioned that actually is one of the few that seems to indicate that there must be an exception among all the other scriptures that talk about not drinking wine. All right. So I actually think that's dealing with two different issues. There's one that talks about taking strong drink in the case of basically somebody that's terminally ill. Mm -hmm. But there's that is talking about wine for your stomach and for the occasional infirmity or your illness. So I, I think that this, this somebody that, that takes it, there are, there's proven health benefits to people that drink a glass of wine at night. Um, and so you may not have to be sick and vomiting and, and be all the way. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> you, may not, you may not have any problem. There may be some health benefit that it was referring to that a healthy, normal person. I So... And also, I'm going to go ahead and disagree with your other point that once you try it, you're going to like it. I have, I don't actually like alcohol for the most part. And, and when Patrick says I'm on the light side of moderate, I'm on the extremely light side of moderate. I've probably had maybe a dozen glasses of wine in my life. I've had like three beers. I've never had tequila. I've never had vodka. I <laughs> Taking notes. No, yeah. go ahead. Continue I, going. I'm, I'm not taking notes for anything you're saying. I'm just going to send God a message. When we're done, go ahead. Sorry, what? How much so, tequila? <laughs> All right. So no, I've never, I've never touched anything that would be considered strong drink, with the exception of a margarita. And margaritas are, are a mixed drink, and they're a girly drink. If you notice, I'm wearing a pink shirt. I'm not man enough to try a, go, a shot of whiskey. I've never had a shot of whiskey. The Bible says not to drink strong drink. The Bible says not to get drunk. 
the Bible says not to abuse alcohol clearly, and it warns against alcohol in almost every book of the Bible. So I think that it's something that we should touch it, if ever, with a 10-foot pole. Now, if if you are if you're somebody that's convicted not to drink alcohol, I think the, the, the Bible supports that all over the place. Unless you tell me that there were that when Jesus turned water into wine, that, he, that it was grape juice, or that any time that the Bible refers to wine, that it's referring to grape juice, because it's referring to wine using the same words that it refers to um, somebody drinking wine and getting drunk off of wine is the same Hebrew word in those cases with it, that it's prohibiting using wine as it's using when it talks positively about it, um, either in an application like where, where Jesus can turn water into wine or where other people that were known as men of God that drank wine and the problem wasn't the, like Noah, for instance, the problem wasn't that he drank the wine when he got off the ark. The problem was that he got drunk on the wine. And that's what law, caused him to lose control of his facilities and he's laying around not clothed as well as I am tonight, apparently. So if, if you get to the point that your children have to come walk into the room backwards, with a blanket, cover you up because you've been drinking, you're probably drinking too much. <laughs> and so I would say that Noah had drank too much, but Noah, I'm guessing, had been drinking before he was on the ark. He was considered a righteous man. God looked throughout the whole earth and Noah seemed to top the list and Noah drank wine. So anyways, me and Noah, we drink wine on occasion. <laughs> I have never drank enough alcohol to get buzzed. I've never felt the effects of alcohol. Um, there was one time my wife and I went out to a Mexican restaurant and um, and so, and I'm pretty new to this wine thing. Um, it's been about three years since I tasted it the first time. And before that I was anti-wine through and through. And my wife at times had mentioned to me that she was concerned that it was a pride issue for me. So there was a few, a few things that were peculiar about me. I grew up, I never watched TV. I grew up without a TV. I never watched movies. Um, and I was pretty much against movies. I never drank wine. Um, I'd never been to a doctor, you know, there's some, some things like that, that they can be, you know, thank God I never had, you know, I never had a broken arm and I never had to go to the doctor. I still, to this day, I've never been to a doctor. So those are things that, you know, I'm blessed by, but when it becomes, when that becomes the focus or that becomes part of my religion and who I am is the fact that I'd never tasted wine. And a part of the reason that I was afraid to even taste it after I was convinced that there was nothing unscriptural about me tasting it, I was, I was afraid to taste it because I wanted to mess up this record that I had of never having tasted wine. And so I started realizing that for me anyways, that it was, I was maybe doing the right thing, but for the wrong reasons. And so I'm, I'm not saying that the solution to that is I had to go have a glass of wine, but I had been quite judgmental about people that drank wine in the past or drank alcohol. And I had written it all off as one and the same. You're an alcoholic if you, if you drink anything. Um, and I have some reasons, which I'll go into later, as far as why it was so impactful to me at a very young age, besides the fact that my parents were against it. There was an, one event in my life that happened that changed me forever. And I was determined that no matter what, I'll never drink wine. And as of a, a few years ago, actually, a lot of my friends on Facebook, I've met driving Uber. And a, a, lot, of, a lot of them are out drinking when I've met them and we become friends. And, and a lot of them know me um, as somebody that ne never drinks because I told them it, it always comes up. If you drink, pick up a drunk passenger, they're always like, oh, thanks for picking me up, get me home safe, whatever. And. And I, I got to get the, you know, a lot of them are complaining about their, uh, about their alcohol problem. I got to get this under control uh, and whatever. And, and a lot of them will ask, do you ever drink, man? And, and that's just, I mean, drunk people are super friendly. And so they, they always want to talk the whole ride. They want to talk. And so um, some of you guys, I met you at your low point in your life. And you're probably, you're probably chuckling right now because you're not usually that friendly. Uh, but anyways, so a lot of them have heard my story about how I never tasted alcohol. And then, some of you might have, might have befriended me because because I was maybe this non-alcoholic role model in your life that encouraged you to quit drinking alcohol. And now, I've, now I'm on here telling you that I drink alcohol. So something changed a few years ago for me with it, and I have now. So anyway, um, so Patrick, yeah. Andy and I, have no, we have no experience on this. What does it feel like to get drunk? Because you tell your kids, once you try it, you're going <laughs> to like it. Sure. I would rather drink a soda than to drink a beer. I think they're nasty. I don't like the taste of it. Yeah. And, but... I think that the only reason, the only time that I like to drink a wine is if I'm having a steak. If I go out and I have a steak, I enjoy a glass of wine with a steak. I think that the meat and the wine goes together good, and I actually enjoy that. I don't like regular wine. It has to be sweet wine, sparkling wine, something like that. I'm just not, I've not, it's not something you have to learn to like. You have to train yourself to like it. And part of the reason I think you like it is because of this psychological connection of the escape from reality, of the 
of the drunken uh, of the mm-hmm. the high that you get from it. So anyway, what is what what do you think of when you think of that? Okay. To it? So um, let me let me read a verse of the Bible here um, that associates with that because as far as alcohol goes, when you find stories in the Bible where it talks about alcohol and it's an issue, it's a problem. Like everyone said the same thing. Anyone who's, you know, read through the Bible quickly realizes that 99 out of a hundred verses in the Bible that mention alcohol are not favorable. You know, it's hard to bring a strong case for drinking. I always tell people, you know, if you're going to drink, be sure to drink Christian whiskey, you know, and that, you know, that always gets a laugh because it's like, well, there are no Christian cigarettes or Christian, you know, whiskey. Um, <clears throat> so what a lot of people don't seem to realize is when you read through the Bible and you see the verses about alcohol and the problems, a good majority of them are sexual. When you think about when when do people typically drink? OK, they're typically going to going to drink on a weekend when people go out to a bar what is the number one reason a guy buys a lady a drink <laughs> lady uh a girl a drink out at a bar okay uh hopefully you know there aren't any ladies sitting at a bar getting free drinks from fellas okay uh that's not where ladies hang out so forgive me ladies for uh, using that term women uh, what's the purpose of that man buying the woman the drink? Well, in Habakkuk 2.15, it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So one of the number one reasons that guys try to feed women drinks is to get them to make bad decisions. And the, and the me, Bible... Don't give me and, wine, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah why are you trying air- to get Andy... To drink wine, Caleb. I, see, thank you for reading that reference. I now, now I know, I know. So, in the same way, uh, alcohol is often referred to as tongue oil because it gives men confidence and it loosens up their tongue where they're comfortable and confident to talk to women. So, typically, alcohol is very oftentimes associated with sexuality. And with that being said, I would like to just go over the first two cases in the Bible where it talks about alcohol, it also happens to talk about drunkenness. So the first one, and and I, and believe me, I'll be more than happy to uh, tell you how stupid you feel when you're drunk. I'll get into the, you know, the sensation in a minute, but in Genesis 9 21, we read about when after Noah got off the ark, he plants a vineyard, he makes wine, he gets drunk. Okay. And he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, what I am going to tell you is that the very first case of alcohol in the Bible is when Noah gets drunk and then is sexually molested by one of his children. And you say, "Uh, I don't remember that that happened. Yes, it did. No, Lot Lot is the second instance. Go back and read Genesis chapter nine. Uh, Ham was not in trouble because he saw his father. It says he was in trouble because what they did unto him. It was what Ham did to his father. Okay, it was sexual immorality and it was perverse. That's the you think that Ham was cursed and sent away because he happened to walk in a room where his dad did something stupid? No, it was because what he did to him. And the Bible says that. Read the story again. You'll see it. Number two. And thanks for bringing up the story, Caleb, is the story of Lot. When Lot gets out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's out of the town with his two daughters, his two daughters get him to get drunk so that they can have sex with their father so that they can have children by him. And the, All the children kids that are watching, you might want to shut off Facebook right about now. <laughs> yeah. go, turn on, like go, go turn on Veggie Tales again <laughs> yeah. and let Patrick finish the story here. This hey, isn't how it works. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> not how you're supposed to do it. Not only that, the <laughs> children that they have are the fathers of the Ammonites and the Moabites, two groups of people that were so wicked in the Bible that God gave specific orders to the children of Israel to wipe out every man, woman, and child. There are no Moabites, there are no Ammonites that exist today because of how wicked they are. And that came from Lot having incestual relations with his daughters. And what did they have to do to make that happen? They had to get him drunk. Okay, so with that being said, 
I'll tell you, I agree with you, Caleb. I have never tasted an alcohol that I like the taste of. And let me tell you, I tried. OK, because, you know, I was a kid that didn't grow up in a Christian home, never touched a Bible till he was uh, 20 years old. You know, I, I, I didn't know anything about it. And for me, you know, I like drinking and I wanted to keep doing it. So I really wanted to find an alcohol that tasted good. I would take a milkshake over any bit of alcohol any day of the week because it tastes way better. And my waistline will testify to that. But. <laughs> The reason I liked alcohol was because it helped me to forget about problems in my life. It was something that I could go to where I could just forget about the stress, the anxiety, anything. And, the, and Andy, you mentioned this. The problem today is that Christians will go to the bottle. And what are we supposed to do when we are stressed, when we are anxious, when we are fearful? We're supposed to go to God. We're supposed to go to God and prayer, and God is the one that's supposed to give us the strength. We're supposed to cast our cares upon him. And the fact is, every time I sobered up, all those problems were still there. Nothing was ever better. So it was just a temporary fix. And then what I found out was I got to a spot where all of a sudden, hold on, I am going to- we need the cricket noise again. No, I just need to go here and block someone that is just unbelievably rude. Uh, that is just telling us all kinds of vulgarity. So let me see if I can do this. Wow. Yeah, real classy guy. Yeah, thanks for catching that. I wasn't I wasn't monitoring the comments there. Yeah, well, um, jump right in. I'm going to see. If, yeah, uh, if anybody else wants to get this. on here and comment, um, I would say, uh, whoever you are, sir, if you're still on there before we block you, um, up your game there, man. I mean, is that all you got? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, come on, like, you use the, yeah, anyways. Yeah, if you're going to try to insult us, like, try to demonstrate a little bit of IQ on here. And, like, don't, don't just resort to saying the same thing over and over again and using vulgarity. Yeah, so I actually I actually think that that is something that is very odd to me is why people ever get hooked on it in the first place because it tastes, to me, it tastes so bad when I first tried the stuff. Um, and it's, it doesn't matter how much you mix it up. Most alcohol to me, it has, it just has this, this hot, unnatural, I mean, it's just this, it's just this weird thing that it almost seems like your body rejects it as if you had mixed paint thinner in with your apple juice or something like that. It just seems like something's wrong with it. And on top of that, you have to pay like three times as much for it. If you go to a restaurant and you want to get a soda, you can get a soda for like a buck 50 or a couple bucks. If you want to get a, a glass of wine, you're going to pay like eight or 10 bucks for it. And I'm like, why would, when we go out to eat normally, even if it's a nice dinner and I it, I don't know, it's something cultural about it. And sometimes my wife and I'll go to dinner at somebody's house that sets out a, a glass of wine on the table. And I feel like, you know, I want to, I want to humor them by drinking the alcohol, even though I, even though I'm not big on it, but I, I want to be um, good friends. We have actually a friend that's there in Grand Junction. You're familiar with them. Uh, Joanna lives up on Glade Park. She's an amazing cook. And, and when she makes a meal, she has a handwritten menu on the, on the, on the wall and she is very formal the whole dining experience and it's like for me to not drink the wine would like mess up the whole experience and um it's like to me it would almost be an insult so the way that i the way that i've looked at it is is like um when paul says if i eat meat and it makes my brother stumble i won't eat meat if i if i don't drink wine and it makes my brother stumble then maybe i should drink wine is kind of where i started coming to with it because it was it was an issue for me but i tried to like it and i've tried a quite a few different kinds of wine. In fact, we just bought another one the other day in the store that I haven't tried yet. Um, and I'm still planning on trying that after Patrick and, and Andy get through with me here. Mm -hmm. But um, I have not found an alcohol that I'm like, all right, when I, when, I, when I drink a glass of wine, this is what I want to try. I keep trying new ones and I'm like, one of these days I'm going to find one that's really good. In the meantime, I found some that it's like, oh, that's pretty good. Water. <laughs> Water. <laughs> so anyways, that's something that's very interesting to me about it is it's like, I'm as attracted to going and guzzling a whole bottle of whiskey about like I would be to go bash my head in a brick wall. 
it has it's like i'm not it's, it's it's just as appealing to me as going and smoking a cigarette or a cigar which apparently we have a difference of opinion on that as well but anyways i won't get into that <laughs> tonight because that that's a whole other episode should i smoke cigars like patrick does um no i guess you're a moderate you're 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 a low moderate cigar smoker you're not a only smoker. because i don't have the time <clears throat> Okay, so sorry about that. It took me a second to figure out how to mute. So, um, folks, anytime Can someone you... shows up and and messages us 40 times in a row with well-thought-out, intelligent, thought-provoking comments, uh, we are going to mute them all the time. So, unfortunately, this guy could type out... Uh, cuss words and hit enter faster than I could find the button. So you have to go through that. <clears throat> I know there's a way to delete them. And actually, uh, Joanna, if you could, uh, she's on and she has access to, um, she's an administrator. If you can just go through and delete those comments, you know, he uh, he's just uh, an obscene fool. So, <clears throat> okay. So I don't remember where we were before we got uh, rudely interrupted by that <laughs> uh, uh moron <laughs> so okay Chris says so, you need to not look so bored I andy I mean, yeah you a drink i don't know okay so um as much as i like that this conversation is veering off into the best type of wine to have with whatever meal you're going down <laughs> i'm going to go ahead and pull it back to the bible so uh this is one thing that I think not only is associated with Christians drinking, but I think can be associated with Christians and a lot of activities. So the question, uh, it is not, can a Christian drink alcohol? That's a dumb question. The, quest the question needs to be, should a Christian drink alcohol? See, and let me explain one of the biggest problems in American Christianity today. It's the idea that Christians almost never, ever ask themselves questions about anything. They just go along with whatever their friends are doing, and that's really as far as it ever goes. They never think about it. They never come to a decision about anything. And when we do ask ourselves a question, it is, and, and Caleb, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only time I find Christians nowadays, and keep in mind, it's a very general statement. I'm not talking about everybody, but it seems like the majority of Christians, the reason they will crack open their Bible and blow the dust off of the thing is to try to figure out what they can get away with. That's the right. reason that they get in and study the Bible. And unfortunately, that is a level of maturity that's on par with my toddler. Because my toddler is the one that will learn what the rule is and try to figure out how close he can get to breaking the rule without actually getting uh, caught by dad where he gets a spanking. And he will stand All right, right so on the line. Here's where we cut to break. So folks here at Bible Thumper, this is not how we do it. We don't dust off our Bibles to find out what we can do. We dust them off so we can thump you over the head and tell you you shouldn't drink alcohol. All right, continue, Patrick. Thank you. So... And We're back on the Bible yeah. first. <laughs> so After the commercial break. What I believe the mature thing to do is to ask the question, how holy can I be? Instead, Christians in America today, the popular thing is how much sin can I live in and still consider myself a Christian? Or how close to sin can I get? And the fact of the matter is, I'll use the hot stove analogy again. God tells us don't touch the hot stove. And Christians today are like, who do you think you are to tell me what I can and can't do? And they just plant their hand on the stove and they burn it because they're immature and they don't like being told no. And the idea of trying to get our hand within one inch of the hot stove is just as stupid. So I say the best thing to do in every area of our life as a Christian is ask the question, how holy can I be? Now, whether you want hey, to do you, that or you not, might that's straighten fine. Your, you might yeah. straighten your collar out just a little bit there. It's top, can you top, can you, you bought top button? You might also check, make sure you got your prayer shawl handy yeah. there too. That one? Okay. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah, you look more holy now. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead, continue. <clears throat> so anyway... I think the, 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 the question is often wrong. Christians always ask, well, can I do this? Well, can I do that? You know, or do I have to do this? And if you're asking those questions, this is what I see. If you're looking for the bare minimum of holiness in your life, you're probably going to be getting the bare minimum of blessing. 
You're going to have the bare minimum of closeness and effectiveness. God's going to be able to use you to do his work the bare minimum because you're looking to try to stay right on the line. And honestly, I get it. I've been there as a Christian, but I've also had the time where I said, you know what? I'm sick of this. All this stuff, it makes me sick. I'm tired of it. I want to run as hard and as fast as I can toward God. And as soon as you get 10 paces out in front of everyone, they start throwing rocks at you. Let me tell you, I don't have the position of don't drink at all because it's popular or it makes me friends in church, let alone outside of church. I have that position because I want to be serious about God. Now, please understand I know there are lots of other people that disagree with me that are very sincere, that love God, and that are very close to God, and that are doing wonderful things for God. So before I get misquoted as saying anyone that thinks differently than Patrick is not close to God, I'm just going to throw that out there so it's clear. But I hope you can at least understand the, the concept or the theory of stop asking the wrong question, stop trying to do the bare minimum, and instead find out where God is and make a beeline for him and see if your life gets any better. Okay. I've gone on for long enough. Someone jump in or ask a question or tell me that I'm crazy. Andy, we haven't heard from you in a while. What do you think? I'm I'm trying to think of a question as far as we, so we have a question on here that needs to be answered. So somebody asked us us to 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 define, um, to, to define drunkenness. Okay. Trying to find out. I don't remember who that was that asked. There it is. That's my wife. Could one of you define drunkenness? So by one of you, she's probably not talking to me because she hears from me plenty. Yeah, Andy. Andy, go ahead. What do you think drunkenness would constitute? What what is drunkenness? Man, drunkenness. I would define that as loss of trying to think here. So my, if when I think of people getting drunk, I think of someone that can't think for themselves. They've lost all. You know, they, they're stumbling, they're walking, and they've lost all sense of motor skills, honestly, and they're slurred. Of course, that's the extreme drunkenness. No, I don't. Once again, I've never, you know, been drunk to where I may, is being buzz drunk. I don't know how that feels. So, like, I don't know what at that point do you do. Is that drunkenness? I'm not exactly sure. Okay, you know, Caleb. extreme Sorry, yes, go I'm ahead, Andy. I thought I'm sorry. I thought you were. I thought you were finished. I was going to move the question <laughs> over to Caleb. No, I was. So like that's that's. So to define drunkenness to me is someone that has lost complete control. And on that note, once we lose once we lose complete control of ourselves mentally and also physically, it there, you're honestly giving yourself over to a really powerful darkness. Honestly, because you can do a lot of things. I mean, we have society today where. I mean, there's so much things that happened through and someone someone being drunk and later not remembering what happened. And I think that's something that is concerning to me. But so that's what that's what I see when I think about drunkenness is just someone that has honestly given their body over, may may I say the devil almost, the darkness. How about to another power? Yes, exactly. To another power. Sure. And they no longer have control of themselves and they're they're just saying things, doing things that they'll honestly when they wake up the next morning, they'll have a terrible headache and no recollection of what happened 12 hours prior sure. to them waking up. Okay, Caleb, yeah. jump on in. What you, if you're going to define drunkenness. So I, I wish that I had done a little bit of study on this to find out exactly how alcohol works and what it does to the brain. But what I, I I'll jump in with that when you're done. Okay, so what I understand is alcohol is actually a poison. It is. It's one of five types of poison. It's the one that kills you the slowest. There is no amount of alcohol that you can drink that will not kill your brain cells, period. Continue. (laughs) Okay. He's done. Take one tap out. He still wants to keep going. He still wants to keep. Okay. Well, I'll put more pressure on. I'll squeeze, Andy. I have no problem squeezing. (laughs) I guess God bless me with enough brain cells that I still got a few left after having a dozen glasses of wine. So, hey, maybe that's my problem. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's something that's very interesting is it's actually, it's doing a phys- it's not just a, it's not just one of these things where it's, we, where we do something that God doesn't like, and it affects somebody else. Drinking alcohol is one of the few things that the Bible talks about that directly negatively affects us as a human being, not just the long-term Instantly. health benefit. Yeah. Not just the long-term health benefit of the fact that we could, 
um, you know, lose a brain cell or two over the course of 30 years or whatever. I don't think that they're, you're, anyway, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But the science behind it is basically it's something that you shouldn't be taking into your body in large quantities. It has a very negative effect. Common sense should tell us don't get drunk. Don't drink so much wine that it shuts your brain off and you lose control of yourself. And there's other ways. It seems like the Bible talks about other other things that you can get drunk on other than other than wine, including being drunk on love. And if anybody can, uh, to me, being drunk on love is probably the closest thing that I could imagine to how it affects your body. Andy, it's okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna explain this. All right. <laughs> okay. But it seems that it must be. It must be something that uh, directly affects your body and, and your brain in such a way that you are transformed into an, an, an altered state of mind. And there's other things that I've done. All right. So the closest thing that I could relate it to is if you're watching a movie. If you go into a movie theater and you walk out of that theater, you know what you know what it's like to try to get your bearings again because it's like you're you're on that you're focused on that screen and you're in another world you're you're in this other person's story and when you walk out of there if it's especially if it's a violent movie you tend to kind of start looking over your shoulders to see when or and maybe I've not watched enough movies maybe you guys are completely immune to this but after I watch. After I watch a movie, this oftentimes is after I Caleb watched his Frozen fourth movie. <laughs> yeah, after she he watched Frozen. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's, you're in an altered state of mind. If if somebody's watching television, um, and somebody else walks into the room, you you may not even notice them because you're so focused on that TV screen. And so it's to me to me it's altering your state of mind beyond beyond anything that I've ever experienced to the point that people are going to completely lose control of their 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 function as a, as a person. And oftentimes you're going to not only hurt yourself, you might, I've watched, I've watched people get on these little electric scooters in Austin and I actually get a real kick out of it. It's really hilarious to watch because a sober person on a, an electric scooter is hilarious to watch in the first place. I have a little backstory on that that I'm not going to tell you, but I tried an electric scooter and, and it, it did not go over real well. And I was completely sober. It's he, went over. <laughs> he went over. He went over. He went over. I, I limped to the other side of the street after I got through with the scooter taking advantage of me. And I sat down on the sidewalk and I just was like hoping that I would just die. It was miserable. So he wasn't even drunk. I watched these people get on a scooter. Okay. You mentioned God tells us not to, not to touch a hot thing. All right. He gave us pain for a reason. People complain all the time. That why is there pain and suffering in the world? God gave us pain for a good reason. As, as a baby, once, once you start doing something that hurts you a few times, it starts knocking some sense in at a at an early age, and we start to learn to preserve our bodies and not kill ourselves and and harm ourselves. The same thing the same thing to me goes for the idea of. So I watch these guys get on the, on these scooters, and they'll they'll ta- they'll do a somersault, face plant in the asphalt, get back up and get back on the scooter and face plant again, and they they can't hardly keep their balance before they get on the scooter, and then they think they're going to be able to go. And some of them actually get it down the road a little ways, and then they crash again. And it's hilarious because I'm like. God gave you the, 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 your brain so that you could keep from tearing your body up. You're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be like, what happened? Did I get run over by a train? You're going to be miserable, sore, probably, yeah, you're probably going to hate yourself. And if, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so let me jump in here. What Caleb is trying to remember is Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds, without cause who hath redness of eyes they that tarry long at the wine they that go to seek mixed wine okay and it talks about how the stranger wakes up and he can't remember how he got hurt and then he goes right back to the bottle so let me let me just answer the question since i'm apparently the only one of the three of us that's ever been drunk and the question came in also where's the line between buzzed and drunkenness okay so In in the state of Colorado, the legal limit for drinking is 0.08. That means 8% of your blood is alcohol. Okay, that, I mean, that that sounds insane to me. So how much, but anything under that, you're wondering how much blood a person has in their body. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. So typically where you're going to get there is after two drinks, you're going to be approaching or at or barely over the legal limit, depending on some factors. Usually anyone that has a third drink is going to be over the legal limit. Now that's the state of Colorado stating that 
we don't want you driving a 2,000 pound piece of metal that can go 100 miles an hour if you've had more than two drinks. But the way that I see it is as soon as I am in, affected by alcohol, if any of my faculties are impaired, that's what drunkenness is. Far too many people take this ridiculous idea of when you can't stand anymore, then you're drunk. Okay, God does not want to see the Christian in any position leading up to that. You make lots of dumb decisions and ruin your life and the lives of others way before you get to that point. What I believe is if you want to make the argument that it's okay to drink, just don't get drunk, then really where you're at is you're going to find yourself affected and you're going to be in a mood altering state and your faculties are going to be um, affected by alcohol and your judgment is going to be impaired. Really, you know, by the time you're done with your first drink or you're moving somewhere into your second one. Okay. Now, when, when we were getting ready for this and I had a little bit of time today, I opened up kind of uh, all the notes I had on drinking and why you shouldn't drink that I've compiled over the years when I've kind of, you know, taught this message before. And then I thought, you know what, what I really want to hear is all the arguments for drinking. So I got online and I Googled this stuff and I started looking at it and all of these ideas were ridiculous. Every article I've read about Christians drinking is constantly warning people about how they need to do it carefully and not have too much because of their testimony. And it says to drink, but don't be a stumbling block. Uh, drink, but guard against the progressive nature of alcohol. Drink, but do it prayerfully. Drink, but don't drive. Drink, but maintain control and only drink Christian whiskey. You got to remember that. That's the most important. Go to your local church, find the Christian approved, Jesus approved whiskey, and that's the stuff that you want to drink. So I personally think it's ridiculous that, what again, what are we doing? Everyone's asking the question, well, you know, uh, how uh, uh, how much is drunk? You are literally asking how much alcohol can I drink before I slip across the line into sin? That is literally the question that we are asking right now. And if that's where we are, just go ahead and look up to heaven because Jesus is coming. It is ridiculous that that is where Christianity is at. Mm. We're saying, oh, well, one and a half drinks is too much, but one drink is okay with Jesus. Great. That's where you're at. Wonderful. All right. I feel the love. Yeah. All right. So, so again, I didn't come on here to bring a, a really strong argument for alcohol because I don't think it's important that Christians should drink alcohol. Like you said, I think it's permissible in the case that you're not drunk. Um, mm -hmm. So here is a question that I'd have for both of you guys. Let's or hear one it. of you guys. If the devil was going to attack uh, the family unit, Say you're a you say you're a family of five, and the devil decides that he wants to mess up God's plan here. Who do you think that he would logically pick as a target in the family? You're always going to want to attack the dad. You're going to want to attack the patriarch, the biblical head of the family, the leader. Yeah, that would make more sense than the two year old, right? The toddler, sure. All right, so the toddler isn't going to be drinking wine anyways, so. Um, I have heard this story so many times of, of drunken fathers that beat their families, beat their wives, were out of control. The marriages fall apart. A lot of, a lot of marriages in, that fall apart in Christian, in Christian homes have to do with fathers that were drinking too much alcohol. I've heard it over and over again. So we got to just get them down to like one drink or one and a half drinks where, where we need to make a t-shirt. Yeah. Okay. One and a half drinks for Jesus. All right. <laughs> All right. We can start a new podcast tomorrow. One and a half drinks for Jesus. That, that would actually, that would be a catchy title right there. That's some clickbait. All right. But if you, if you are tempted by that and you think that you're going to end up in that position, I would say the Bible says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm -hmm. if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your alcohol causes you to sin, cut it out. It doesn't say that, but I'm going to say that. So sure. if you are drinking alcohol, and there is very, very few places in the Bible that says it is permissible. It's never commanded. Um, some Christians feel it's necessary to take a during communion because Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He took the bread and dipped it in the, in the cup of wine. 
Um, I actually disagree with the fact that it has to be wine because it's not, the, it, it, I think grape juice is fine or it could be whatever. Um, but I, I certainly think that you could be a Christian, never drink wine and take it at communion. And, and that would be a pretty good exception or a pretty good time to do it. We're talking about something totally different to take, to take a little wine at communion than it is to, to go and get drunk. When Jesus was taking wine at communion, of course, it's during a feast, but I think it was actually a pretty common thing for them to have a glass of wine with their meal. And I think that Jesus probably drank wine, but I cannot, I cannot, that's, that seems to be inferred through scripture, but it's not directly, um, it's not it's just a direct application. Jesus turned water into wine. And if that was going to be such a bad thing that if they had drank a little wine at the wedding, then he probably wouldn't have done. Um, again, this is, this is kind of in juncture on my part to assume that Jesus is saying, it must be okay for you to drink wine at this wedding because I'm here and I turned water into wine. Um, I think it was the miracle that he was doing that was more significant than what he was creating. He, he didn't come here to make wine. He came here to show that he was God. And that was the beginning of his ministry. Go ahead. To a lot of Christians, that is the only thing Jesus ever did. Because that's the only thing I ever hear about. Right. Well, Jesus made water into wine. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you translate? What, what's your take on that? Okay, sure. Let me give you, let me start have, off. by. We have, we have four minutes left here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. No, go ahead. <clears throat> so let me start off by giving you a Bible verse. Jesus did not make and give out alcoholic wine. Why? Because Habakkuk 2.15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Jesus couldn't have done it. It would have been a sin. The prophet Habakkuk Read the said rest. so. Read the rest of the verse, though. Woe unto it's him that you giveth. Give... Go ahead. It's if you give them enough to make them drunk and take advantage of them, right? It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Okay. So if you're giving out alcohol, but not getting them drunk to look on their nakedness, then that's acceptable. Is that's, that I, the argument you're that making? Would, yes, that's the argument I'm making. <laughs> Jesus, didn't, Jesus didn't do it, and then go around and look at everybody at the wedding naked. That's not what he was doing. Okay, so therefore, you're, so it was you're saying it was grape juice. He turned water into grape juice, not wine. I believe so. Okay, and okay. the Bible right. actually, and the Bible actually talks about that in several cases where it defines alcoholic wine, like in Proverbs, as mixed wine when it giveth its color and its cup and it moveth itself aright. It's talking about how wine, which what it does is it runs in a cup. Okay, so if you ever see a wine connoisseur take the glass and swirl the wine around the glass, the way that it runs down the glass is different than juice or water would. And it talks about the quality of the wine. And that's what Proverbs is talking about. So in the Bible, the word wine is used for everything that comes from the vine. It's translated normally as fruit of the vine. That would okay. be more the, the literal, the literal so translation of what they're saying. The problem is everyone immediately believes that it is always alcoholic well that's fine if you want to believe that but that's not the case and there are several right. times in the bible where it's clear and it even goes over by specifying when it is alcoholic wine now i know there are two verses in the bible that people use in order to try to make their case for why it's okay for christians to drink and we brought up both of them jesus turned water into wine and the verse in Timothy about when Paul said it's okay for Timothy to drink because he had an upset stomach. For some reason, though, people are unwilling to read the literally hundreds of verses that talk about how alcohol and wine are a nightmare and to stay away from them. And it's terrible. We read, I could, well, we only have about two minutes left, so I don't yeah. want to get on another, you know, um, rant here. I would love to do it, but I should probably save it for later. But here's what I'll tell you. Okay. <clears throat> In the Bible, the one thing that you do find is that it gives the command for kings and priests not to drink wine or strong drink. When you read through the Bible in Revelation 1, 6 and 1 Peter 2, 9, you find out that Jesus and Peter both call us kings and priests. As soon as you get saved, you are both a king and a priest. The Bible says neither of those two are allowed to drink ever. Okay, And I don't know how you try to get around it because it's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It works out together. But again, it's not going to be popular. But you know what? We're not trying to build All an right. audience. You hit the nail on the head there. 
That was actually really good. We all agree it's pretty dangerous. High five. High five. Here we go. <laughs> well, we're down to the last minute here, right? 30 seconds. Take us out, Caleb. Well, um, yeah, thank you guys for coming on here. It's always great to discuss this kind of stuff. And I think we all agree alcohol is extremely dangerous and probably don't touch it. If you do, I might be wrong. If you do touch it, be careful. Um, thank you guys for coming on here. Yeah. I appreciate you guys as friends. It was a lot Thanks, of fun. Andy. Yeah. Andy, thank you very much for joining yes, us. Sure. Hopefully we can have you on another time. Yeah. Love it. Okay, with that, next uh, next week, same time, we are going to get into, I think the topic is, is Jesus God? So hopefully yeah. that one won't be too controversial or upsetting right. to anybody, but we'll see. You're going to get an earful if you comment that Jesus is a God, let me tell you what. Okay, I appreciate you guys. Caleb, uh, Andy, nice meeting you. Thanks. You guys have a good night. Bye-bye.